So beyond the biodiversity of food, as we've been hearing, biodiversity also underpins food and its production through the provision of a range of ecosystem services. This is what I want to talk about and how we go about understanding these things in the context of assessments. And as we've heard, this includes biodiversity that maintains soils and their fertility that, amongst other things, underpins the pastures on which livestock thrives. Biodiversity that, through uh, the development of habitats in the right kinds of places, will improve uh, the flow and control of flow and provision of fresh water. We're living in a world that uh, is increasingly water stressed, areas of acute water security. Biodiversity through the provision of water services can potentially go some way to addressing that. Of course, pollination services. The results here are from a study, a recent study indicating or suggesting that we're becoming more dependent on animal pollinated crops. And above and beyond these, of course, as we've heard, there are services relating to pest and disease control, services relating to the provision of wild foods, whether in a fisheries context or in a terrestrial context, and often as a safety net, as we've heard from some of our speakers from the floor, in the provision of spawning grounds, potentially, uh, habitat within which uh, species are nurtured. And the way that we manage land on farm and off farm will influence the balance of those different services. We are faced with choices and trade-offs. And as we've heard this morning, uh, the HE targets for biodiversity adopted two and a half years ago reflect this in the breadth of targets that governments committed to. We have targets pertaining to the sustainable use of fisheries, of, of forests, um, and of farming and crops. We have targets relating to pollution to other kinds of threats and how we alleviate those. We have targets relating to genetic diversity of crops, of their wild relatives, of other commercially, uh, commercially valuable species. We have targets relating to the maintenance of ecosystem services for human well-being. Well, if we're going to develop those and, uh, and uh, achieve those kinds of targets and goals, and indeed if we're going to answer any questions relating to how the world is changing, we need good, good data and good indicators to base that on. Within which, within which we can monitor change and hopefully uh, use that to make better decisions, both in policy and in practice. But in this kind of a context, to bring together the information we need to create those indicators and those metrics and those storylines to understand change, we need to draw information together from a wide range of sources. The example I have here of the Biodiversity Indicators Partnership was one such global, multidisciplinary, cross-institutional initiative to bring together and improve the availability and use of information at a global scale on not only biodiversity change, but change in those areas uh, that affect biodiversity and that are affected by biodiversity in the context of global commitments such as the HE targets. And a partnership like that, and it was truly multidisciplinary, as you can see here, uh, FAO is represented. Uh, we have representatives from academia, from the major UN agencies, from NGOs, from a huge sectoral spread. The partnership like that was focused particularly on how can we draw together better quantitative metrics and data. We can get a general flavor and picture of what's happening. We can often get snapshots of what's happening, but how do we really understand change? in a coherent and joined up way. And through a partnership like that, uh, and through a little bit of clever statistics in drawing together a range of metrics, you can start to tell integrated stories about how societal responses to things like biodiversity change are taking place in terms of investments, actions, and policy. In terms of how pressures are changing on biodiversity, we've heard a lot about pressures, and how the state of biodiversity itself may be changing. Now, it's inevitable that a lot of our focus when we look at monitoring biodiversity state and trends focuses on species. We know that. Uh, and it's uh, certainly the case that it's a subset of species or species groups that we know particularly well. But we're getting a little better around the genetics. Uh, there are certainly prospects now emerging for us to get a much better handle on how genetic diversity is changing within wild relatives and wild commercially valuable species alongside the crops and livestock genetic diversity that organizations such as FAO have been compiling statistics on for some time. 
So there are some reasons to hope that we can fill some of those gaps, although, of course, it's small steps. But what about ecosystem services themselves? How do we go about monitoring and measuring those? If that's something you're particularly interested in and in the context of this assessment process, I would say it is an important one to start to explore. The key point I want to make is here. When we think about services, we need to think about the point at which the ecological system, and that's the part on the left of my diagram here, comes together with the socio-economic system. You can't really think about ecosystem services without thinking about the system that provides them or provides the potential for them and the society that benefits from them. Now, a number of assessments uh, have taken place, a number of studies are out there and they're increasing all the time to help us think about how we measure these things. Um, and if I can characterize them, primarily they focused on the two ends. On the one end, understanding how much we have, how much forest, uh, how, how large a population is, for instance, whether a group like pollinators is changing. So very much the, the ecological, the biodiversity end. And at the other, economic estimates of the value of services. And what we've got to try and get to is a better understanding of how the services themselves are changing, because one or other of those two doesn't give us the whole story. We need to be able to look at both ends. And I want to talk a little bit around that as we go forward. When it comes to thinking about the provision of services in terms of the system, uh, its extent, its quality, its condition, and whether that is the habitat, the population groups, the functional traits, um, we're getting better at being able to do that spatially, primarily through a modeling approach. A lot of this work doesn't revolve around in situ field-based monitoring. A lot of it revolves around understanding relationships and building predictive models that you can then apply spatially. Uh, the, the carbon sequestration, the potential for carbon sequestration is a very good example of an ecosystem service that can be uh, understood in this kind of a way and projected in this kind of a way. And we're seeing increasing efforts at national scale to understand how we can model and map and project a range of ecosystem services. This, uh, this image uh, illustrates this with, with South Africa, showing a range of services which, if you understand the underlying biophysical nature of the system, you can start to understand something of the potential for those services to be delivered. But at the other end, uh, as Pavan mentioned this morning, our efforts and our abilities to understand the values of services to society, certainly as a whole, is improving. We can take those kinds of spatial models and we can turn them into values models, often through monetary projections and estimates, but again, as Pavan has said, not always. What I would argue is, uh, and Bob will recognize this from uh, the experiences we had with the UKNEA, it's not often just about the, the, the dollar value, if you like, the monetary value, the total economic value of these things, but it's about the implications for society. And at the broad scale, at the country scale, that's about the implications for jobs and growth. Can we say something macroeconomic about how change in services is changing those kind of issues? And that's a big challenge, but it's one which uh, multidisciplinary groups of researchers are now beginning to take up and to explore how linked models can be put together. What I would also argue, however, and another thing that's a common challenge in these kind of assessments of ecosystem service change, is understanding who the benefits are and when the benefits flow to. So again, whilst one can look in the aggregate at the value of these kinds of service, understanding which groups of stakeholders locally benefit is still something that's very hard for assessments to do well, because you have to drill down to finer scales. And certainly understanding the trade-offs between different beneficiary groups as opposed to the trade-offs between different kinds of services that might be applied under different management regimes seems very much still to be in its infancy. And I think one of the things that it's very important to recognize as we strive to improve the data, the empirical evidence for change and for understanding of these kinds of service, that we still are very reliant on what one might term expert opinion. And that's not something to shy away from, it's something I think to embrace. Again, if we look at the UK National Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which is one of the most recent uh, and one of the most comprehensive in many ways, at the heart of it is a rather unintelligible graphic which illustrates 
if you like, the synthesis of knowledge on how different services are changing in different habitats across the UK. That's in essence what this, this graphic demonstrates. That is not based entirely on empirical evidence. Those are not statistical curves that are displayed there. They're arrows. They're, they're, they're directions of change that are built up from a combination of empirical data combined with expert opinion. Now, I leave for you uh, to, um, to, to bring your own definition of what an expert might be, but uh, ultimately, it's about bringing those things together. In the longer term, it's about approving, improving the balance between uh, the evidence, whatever that may be, um, and, the, and the, um, the more subjective opinion. But I think at this stage, we have to recognize that we can go a long, long way by bringing those things together. And so the point I, I made uh, previously, uh, understanding the distribution of these things is going to be a critical thing. Now, in the context of an understanding of biodiversity for food and agriculture, clearly, as we've heard already, there are major information gaps at the heart of understanding how biodiversity within the food system itself uh, is changing and the implications of that. Uh, but I would argue that we are improving our ability to understand the underlying and surrounding biodiversity and how that influences the food system through a range of other uh, assessments and processes and that there is real opportunity to bring some of that knowledge and understanding to bear in an assessment such as this. Thank you very much.